will give a opening uh, address. Thank you very much, Prof. Rusty. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Eugene. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And a warm welcome uh, to Prof. Dato. Yip Chengha, our um, uh, uh, what call this, uh, consultant press agent from uh, Sam Dhabi, uh, healthcare and also emeritus professor from UM. So thank you for making time and all of you as well, because uh, I think this uh, series of uh, lectures uh, organized by Prof. Eugene and her uh, team, uh, I think it's a very, very uh, important uh, development in the School of Medicine at Dallas University. So again, we'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee, Dr. Punita, Dr. Lim, uh, Lim Yinha, and also Dr. Lim Su Yin, uh, and all the rest of you who have uh, made time for this uh, event. So um, just uh, for me, just to say that, you know, uh, breast cancer as a uh, current dancing and management, uh, it is a very, very important topic. I think anywhere you go around the world, uh, you will see that breast cancer is still number one uh, as, a, as a killer. And in fact, in the, in the year 2008, uh, according to IRC Global Can, there's about 1.38 million cases, new cases alone, uh, 1.38, this is 208, and about half a million deaths from breast cancer every year. So it makes sense that, you know, uh, uh, especially the uh, screening prevention of breast cancer become uh, dominant, a dominant theme for, for people, especially and, and now with this uh, concern. So, um, and breast cancer is, is by far the most common cancer in women worldwide. Eh? Uh, both in developed in developing countries, uh, in low and middle income income countries, incident has been rising steadily in the last years, and um, and uh, increase in life expectancy, increase urbanization and adoption of Western lifestyle. So many uh, so called um, perhaps um, you know some of the factors that may may influence the development, and it's the most common form of cancer affecting women in Malaysia, about one in nineteen. Women in this country are at risk compared to one in eight in Europe and the US. And um, new cases in uh, reported Malaysia in 2003 alone, uh, about 64% of these were aged 40 to 60. I will not go into more detail. I think Prof. Uh, Yip, Dato Yip will give you all these uh, important things. But suffice to say that it, is, it has a central uh, team. It affects uh, not only women, but also families everywhere. You know? All right. So as you know, women are the bedrock of families. The, the moment the woman is not well, the whole family will be affected, right? So very important. So on that note, I think, we, please uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Yip Chengha, uh, Emeritus Professor from UM and also Consultant Breast Surgeon. And, uh, and we hope that you all will learn from her today. Thank you very much. First. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Rosely, um, and to Professor Eugene Leong for inviting me to give this lecture. As Professor Rosely says, breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women in Malaysia, and one in 20 Malaysian women will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. This is actually lower than in the Western countries where it is uh, estimated that one in 10 women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. So breast cancer is uh, of lower incidence in Malaysia compared to the Western world. Um, and even in Malaysia, there is a difference in the incidence between the three races. The Chinese are more likely to get breast cancer compared to the Malays and the Indian women. Okay, now I'll be talking on the current diagnosis and management of breast cancer. Diagnosis of breast cancer means that how do we know that you have a breast cancer if you present with a lump? So if you have a breast complaint, we do triple assessment. Triple assessment is clinical assessment. Clinical assessment means what you present with and what I feel when I examine your breast. Imaging is mammogram and or ultrasound, which is x-rays imaging. And biopsy is when we take a sample from the lung to uh, determine what it is, whether it's cancer or not cancer. And there are two methods of biopsy the fine needle, FNAC, or the needle, percutaneous needle biopsy, the core needle biopsy. I'm going to describe this later. Ideally, we should do a biopsy first before we proceed to surgery uh, for a breast lump. 
Okay, now, clinical assessment means the signs of breast cancer. In early breast cancer, your breast looks normal. There's no changes in the skin. And your breast cancer is discovered when you feel a painless breast lump on breast self-examination. Most cancers are painless. And that is why a lot of women do not come early when they have a lump because they feel that if it's cancer, there must be pain. This is absolutely not true. If it's painful, it's less likely to be cancer because a painful less breast lump is likely to be due to a hormone change. Now we can also have, uh, uh, these are, are palpable cases. Now there are some women who go for screening. screening means you have no lungs, you just go for a health check. Health checks are very commonly done. There are so many of these screening centers in town. I'm sure you've heard of the BP Health, there's also the MJ, and there's also Path Lab. These are just screening centers where they do blood tests for you, they do a mammogram, or they do a breast ultrasound if you have low 40, or they do all sorts of tests, you know, ultrasound, your abdomen, and all that. So these are called screening. So less than 10% of cancers are actually discovered on screening. Other symptoms such as nipple bleeding, nipple retraction, nipple ulcers are not so common. Now, by the time your breast looks like this, it's so clear that you have breast cancer. You see any doctor, even a very junior doctor, they can look at your breast and say, oh, you have breast cancer because these are classical signs. Nipple retraction, you see the nipple has gone inside. Pole the orange is orange skin. You see the skin, it looks like the skin of an orange. And you have see this little ulcer here, skin changes. This is stage three breast cancer. You don't want to come to see me with breast cancer like this because I will have tell you you're stage three. If you're stage one or two, your breast looks absolutely normal and you just feel a lump on palpation. Now, this also is the sign when you have nipple retraction together with skin retraction. You see the skin here. This retractors and there's dimpling, and you can see this best if you lift up your arms. Okay. And ulceration of the nipple. This is a very extreme case. Usually the ulceration starts in the nipple and then it spreads out. This is an old lady who saw me only when it has already gone so big. This is also you should see me when you have just a little ulcer in the nipple, which is also not common because that is called Paget's disease. Now, when you come like this, anybody, maybe even a layman can tell you, you have cancer. Women who do not come early, they go for alternative medicine, which is very common in Malaysia because you all trust the alternative therapist more than you trust the Western trained doctor. So the alternative therapist cannot treat breast cancer, cannot be treated by the Chinese sensei or the Malay bomo cannot. You will end up like this with the fungating, ulcerating. Mm. Can you see? Sorry. Did somebody say something? No, no, I think it was. No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's clear. Prof. Prof. Yeah. It's clear. So yes. some patients come bleeding and with the HP very low and we have to actually transfuse blood before we proceed to doing anything. And some people do not have a lump. The breast just look big and inflamed. This is a very rare type of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer. So it can be treated as a mastitis, which is an infection of the breast, but actually it's a cancer. Now, the second part of your triple assessment, remember I say clinical assessment, Okay, which is what we feel and what we see. The second part is the imaging, which is mammogram and ultrasound. A mammogram looks like this. Now, a mammogram, when you are dense, that means it's very white. So if you are young, your whole breast looks white like this. And then it will be not sensitive. That's why we do not do mammograms routinely for screening in women below 40 because you can't see anything, it's just white. Cancer is also white on mammogram. That's why if you have a cancer here, you won't see it, but you do see a little thing here that is not seen on the other side. So this woman actually has a breast cancer. Now mammogram is done in two views. This is the CC view where it's horizontal and this is the middle lateral view where we press you sort of like obliquely. You know, these are 
uh, mammogram is a plate, you know, and then obliquely is the same woman you see actually she's got something here, something here and something here, which is not seen on this side. If the lump was on this white area, you would have totally missed it. So you would need an ultrasound if you have dense breasts. It's not good for screening, but it's very good if you can feel a lump. It's also operator dependent. That means it depends on the person who's doing it. Ultrasound is actually done for everything. You can ultrasound your neck. You can ultrasound your heart, which is called an echocardiogram. You can ultrasound your abdomen. You can ultrasound the pelvis, which is what the uh, obstetricians do. You can ultrasound the fetus. You know, can do everything. Very versatile. Ultrasound uses sound waves, so there is no radiation at all. It's used as an adjunct to mammogram. So you can see all these are ultrasound pictures. If it's a nice smooth over lump, it's not likely to be a cancer. If it's irregular like this, you know, then it is more likely to be a cancer. So the, the, the person who reports the ultrasound, it's very important that they tell us what it looks like. And of course, as a surgeon, I also want to see what it looks like because I want to have my own opinion, how big the lump is, what it looks like. So again, this is the same mammogram, same mammogram. I'm just talking about ultrasound. You see this woman on ultrasound has one lump here. You see when ultrasound, this is the left breast and this, the, the mark here is where the probe is. So at 12 o'clock to one o'clock, you look at this, 2 cm from nipple, she's got this lump. Now this looks like a cancer. It's not oval, it's not smooth. It's tall and it's irregular. Classical description of a cancer. But she also has another lump. Look at this 11 o'clock, 5 cm from nipple up here. You can see the probe is here. This also is irregular. So this woman has two lumps in the left breast. Both were biopsied, both were cancers. So this means she has multifocal breast cancer and she would have needed a mastectomy. That means she needs to remove the whole breast. We're going to talk about the surgery later on, okay? Now, what about MRI? I'm sure some of you heard about MRI. Some patients also ask, can I do MRI breast? MRI breast, is it necessary? It's expensive. I can tell you in the private sector, it costs 2,000 ringgit for an MRI. It takes a long time because it takes about 45 minutes and you've got to go into this long tube so you cannot have claustrophobia if you do an MRI. Is it going to give me more information than a mammogram and ultrasound? Some breast surgeons would say, yes, they need an MRI. I'm one of the breast surgeons who say, no, 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 I can make a decision on mammogram and ultrasound alone. So this is the same patient, the one with two lungs, that was already seen on mammogram and ultrasound. You see the M on, sorry, that was seen on mammogram ultrasound. See on MRI, this is an MRI picture. You see a lump here, it's white on MRI. And you see another lump here. So again, it says that she's got two lumps and you need to remove the whole breast. So this does not provide actually any additional information in that patient's case. But there are some patients where MRI may be used to determine if a mastectomy, that means removing the whole breast is necessary, which I'm going to discuss again later. Okay, so that was the second part of your diagnostic trial, isn't it? What did I say? I said clinical assessment. I said um, imaging. Now, biopsy is the third part, and this is the one that's going to conclusively tell you whether it's cancer or not. Based on a clinical examination and mammogram ultrasound, you cannot be really 100% sure unless, like the ugly pictures I show you, unless it's so obvious. If you have a lump, which is like stage one, is 2 cm in the breast, early cancer, the biopsy is the final conclusive uh, test to do. There are two ways of doing biopsy, fine needle aspiration cytology and core needle. Now fine needle is fast, is cheap and is least painful because we just use the same needle we use to take blood. However, you need a very good 
cytopathologist. This means it's a pathologist. You know, the pathologist is the lab doctor who looks at all these biopsies. And cytopathologist is a specialist pathologist that will just look at the cells. Okay. So right now, we only do FNAC if we are pretty sure it's not a cancer like a fibroadenoma because this one in the private sector costs only like 200 ringgit. Now, a core needle biopsy, we have to do ultrasound guided if it's a small lump. You look at this, this is the ultrasound and this is the needle that goes in and the radiologists do this and they will make sure the needle goes into the lump and then we take a tissue from it. Core needle biopsy takes a sliver of tissue. It's not just cell. So they take more tissue. The needle is only like one millimeter. So it's very small, but it's bigger than a fine needle. So you need local anesthesia. Okay. The advantage of this is that um, there's more tissue and you don't need a good cytopathologist. Usually any pathologist should be able to read a core needle biopsy. But this is expensive because the new needles, like this needle is an automatic um, core needle biopsy. This needle, we have disposable ones, cost about even like 300 ringgit. So the whole process of doing a core, an ultrasound guided biopsy, including the lab test, the use of ultrasound is about 2000 ringgit. 10 times more than a fine needle biopsy. Okay, now the last one, excision biopsy, which I don't talk about, but um, it's also another form of biopsy. In the excision biopsy, you need a general anesthesia. It's invasive because I'm going to cut up the whole lump. That means you get a cut there. And if cancer is found, you need another surgery because excision biopsy is not enough for cancer. Okay, cancer needs more than an excision biopsy. We will talk about the surgery for breast cancer later. But excision biopsy is 100% accurate. Core needle biopsy ultrasound guided is almost 99% accurate. Again, depends on the skill of the radiologist doing the biopsy. Okay, so these are the types of biopsy. Three types for breast cancer, what we recommend is the core needle biopsy, 2,000 ringgit at least in the private sector. So now we've done the triple assessment and bad news, it is a cancer. So we need further investigations if it's cancer. If it's not a cancer, then great, you may not even need surgery. Okay, if the lump is small. But if it's cancer, you need cancer surgery, which is different from just a normal excision biopsy. So first thing we have to do further investigations because cancers are, breast cancer is not all the same. There are different types. So you need more tests on the biopsy. You need the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, human epidermal growth factor receptor with fish if HER2 is equal. We're going to talk about all these receptors later on when I talk about the pathology diagnosis because these are very important because your treatment depends entirely on what type of cancer you have. Your prognosis depends also on what type of cancer you have. After all these investigations, also there's such a thing called staging investigations. When we want to see whether your cancer has spread to your lungs, liver, or bones. Okay, so staging investigations, we can use a PET CT or a CT scan. And usually what we use depends on the stage. Usually late stage, I'll we'll use PET CT. If it's early cancer, I'll use a CT scan. The difference is that CT scan is cheaper, it's 2,000 ringgit, PET CT is like 3,800 ringgit. But PET CT, you inject an FDG, a radioactive nuclide. So PET CT will have more radiation than a CT scan. So we have to really actually look at the patient and then decide which one to use. We also need blood tests and an ECG if the woman is above 50 years old. So. Once we have staged the patient, staging means um, stage one, two, three, four. 
Staging is based on the size and the lymph nodes. So stage one and two, we do surgery first. One and two means it's operable. The lump is less than 5 cm or maybe lymph nodes are involved. Okay, stage one or two. Stage three and four. Stage three means it's a big cancer with lymph nodes involved or the cancer has involved the skin. And stage four means it's already spread. Stage three and four need chemo first, so we will refer to oncologists. Okay. Counseling and discussion with the patient mm -hmm. is vital because there are so many treatment options. And one of the part of the counseling is also financial counseling because the most important thing for me in breast cancer is that if you need three things, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, the cost can go up to like 70,000 ringgit. So you have to see if the patient got insurance, the patient um, can afford it or not. And if you find that the patient cannot afford it, refer to the government hospital because um, you, know, you don't want the patient to sell a house or something for treatment, okay? Because that is not what we do. We have to do financial counseling and we do not want the patient to go into financial catastrophe because of uh, treatment for cancer. So breast cancer is not treated by me alone. I'm the surgeon, though I am like the captain of the ship because I see the patient first and I will decide who to send the patient to. So for the diagnostic team, <clears throat> it's the surgeon, the radiologist and the pathologist because the three of us make the diagnosis. And of these three, the pathologist is the most important because the pathologist is the one who's going to tell me this is cancer, okay? And once the patient is diagnosed, we also need all these others, you know, oncologists will come in usually only after we have investigated. If we decide stage three and four, we refer to oncology immediately. Otherwise, we do surgery first and refer to them. Psychiatrist, if the patient has terrible, like, uh, has a depression, you know, actually we should do psycho-oncologists except we can't find one. Plastic surgeon, if the patient wants to do breast reconstruction, if the patient is stage four, you need to refer to the palliative care unit because the patient will not be curable. Rehab medicine is after the surgery, everything, because you need to get the arm moving, you need to prevent lymphedema, you know and medical social services department if the patient has financial difficulty. Also the NGOs, like the Breast Cancer Support Group and Hospice Malaysia, if the patient is the terminal breast cancer. So it's one whole team, it's not just me alone. Now, these are the treatment options. Local treatment is surgery and radiotherapy. If you have stage four breast cancer, you know, local treatment is not important because what's the point taking out the breast cancer if it has spread? But if then you need palliation, like the patient I showed you with the fungating breast cancer, then we would need to do surgery first. Like this lady came with such a horrible fungating, smelly, you know, and it's just losing fluid. Mm -hmm. This one we did surgery first, even though theoretically she's stage three, she would need chemo first. So for palliation, surgery gives the best palliation. Now, besides local treatment, which is surgery and radiotherapy, systemic treatment is very important. Which cures more, surgery or systemic treatment? Equally, we can't say we are the, the, only the surgeon can treat. You need the oncologist because oncologist is the person who gives the systemic treatment. So systemic treatment, you have chemotherapy, hormone therapy, targeted therapy, and now the latest in the market is immunotherapy. However, immunotherapy is still undergoing clinical trials, so it is not um, in normal practice, but for certainly for triple negative breast cancer, that means ER, PR, HER2 negative, immunotherapy has been tried in advanced cancers. Immunotherapy is still not recommended in the early stage because there's not much information, not much evidence that it helps. 
Certainly, chemo, there's enough evidence that it helps and it's all fully worked out. Same with hormone therapy, same with targeted therapy. I'm going to talk about all this later. Targeted therapy used to be only the anti her 2 Herceptin, Pergeta, Ketsila, Lepetinib. There are many anti her 2 and can tell you these are the most expensive drugs. Targeted therapy, immunotherapy is very expensive. And now you have this CD4-6 inhibitor, Palgociclip. And now you have this PARP inhibitor called Olaparib, which is for BRCA-associated breast cancer. So you can see more and more targets are being discovered. And I always say the smaller the target, the more expensive the drug. So surgery. Now this is radical mastectomy where you remove the breast, the lymph nodes and the muscle. This is not done anymore. Complication rate is higher compared to modified radical mastectomy because when you remove the muscles, there are two muscles under the breast, the chest wall sinks in and uh, it's cosmetically not nice. I can't even find a radical mastectomy uh, picture to show you because ever since I was in, even in medical school, this was not done anymore. This was the standard operation for over 50 years up to the 1970s, maybe more than 75. This was first described in 1895 by Halstead. This is the Halstead mastectomy. So 1895 until 1960s, until 1970s, this was what was done. Right now, we do the modified radical mastectomy where we remove the breast and the lymph nodes, but we do not leave, we leave the muscles intact. So the cosmetic result is better than radical mastectomy. And this is the standard mastectomy currently carried out. Simple mastectomy is when we remove the breast only without the lymph nodes. This is usually not done because breast cancer spreads to the lymph nodes. So you still got to take out some lymph nodes. This is done if you have a cancer like a sarcoma where it doesn't spread to the lymph nodes. But sarcoma is very rare, okay? All right. So axillary lymph nodes. These are lymph nodes in the armpit. It's important to remove for staging and prognosis and for treatment because if you have lymph nodes involved, you will need chemo. If you have no lymph nodes involved, you don't need chemo. Scans are not accurate to see if it's involved or not. Even a PET CT scan is not accurate. I've had women with PET CT scan which say lymph nodes involved. We take it out, it's not involved. I've had patients where the PET CT scan say lymph nodes not involved. We take it out and it's involved. So it's not accurate. The only way to know is to take it out and send to the lab. Again, the pathologist is the king here. Only they can tell you involved or not. Clinically, it's not easy to tell. I've had, pa I've had uh, patients where I take out the lymph nodes, it looks normal, and yet the report comes back involved. Now, nowadays, we don't have to remove so many lymph nodes unless involved. So if a patient clinically has no involved nodes, you can't palpate any, the mammogram ultrasound don't show any, but you still have to take something out. Sentinel lymph node biopsy is when we take out the first node that leaves, that drains the breast. So how do we identify the first node that drains the breast? Because if this is negative, you would assume the rest of your lymph nodes are negative. So we inject blue dye. There are a few types of blue dye around the areola or around the lump and we massage the mm -hmm. breast. This is done just before surgery once the patient is under anesthesia. So we massage while I scrub up and by the time I open this up, I will be able to see the blue node. It removes only one to three lymph nodes. So the, the reason for doing this is that you get less incidence of lymphedema, which is swelling of the arm. And because we remove less nodes, there's less bisection. So the patient can move the arm better after surgery. But this also may not be 100% accurate. It has a 10% false negative rate. That means this lymph node is negative, but there could be a positive node higher up. Okay, But 90% accuracy is usually good enough for doctors. And this is only for early cancer. So you don't use it if the nodes are involved. You don't use it if the lump is very big. Okay. If you are sure the lymph nodes are involved, then you don't do sentinel lymph node. 
because it is um, there's a this thing that if the lymph nodes is totally replaced by cancer, the blue dye will bypass it and go to the node above. So if you take out the blue node here, it's negative, but actually the sentinel lymph node has been left behind because the sentinel node did not turn blue and it had cancer because the nodal tissue is what picks up the lymph node. So if it's totally replaced, it may not turn blue. Now, this is a modified radical mastect. It's just a flat chest, just one line across. And you can wear an external prosthesis in, and there's special bras and prosthesis for sale. But I have to tell you, just the set can cost you more than 1,000 ringgit, maybe even 2,000 ringgit, just to buy the prosthesis with a special bra. That's just for one set. Uh, and the patient stays for five days post-op. You need two little radiwack drains. It's not a major operation. It's intermediate. It's not minor. And usually you don't need blood transfusion. Okay? You usually lose maybe 200 ml of blood. That's all. And post-op, so we just cover the wound. So simple operation takes only 45 minutes to do a mastectomy and axillary dissection. Now, the other option is breast conserving surgery. Now, this is only possible if your lump is small enough. It's removal of the lump with a clear margin. So it's not enough just to take out the lump. Usually, we have to take out a 1 cm margin around it. So if you have a 2 cm lump, I have to take out 4 cm of, of the breast. If you have a small breast, taking out 4 cm will leave you with hardly any breast. Now, this breast conserving surgery, which is lumpectomy, is also done together with removal of lymph nodes. Because, like I told you, stage, that means stage 1, 2, 3, 4, depends on size and lymph nodes. So if you don't take out the lymph nodes, you won't know what stage it is. Radiotherapy is essential. It's got good cosmetic outcome. Survival between breast conserving surgery and mastectomy is the same. Oh, how come I don't have it? Local recurrence rate is 10% after this because the rest of your breast is here. There's a 10% chance of local recurrence. So when I do lumpectomy, there's only three things the patient need to remember. Number one, radiotherapy is essential. If you don't want radiotherapy, you have to do a mastectomy. Number two, 10% local recurrence rate, which you have to accept. So you need to do a mammogram and ultrasound every year to pick it up early. Number three, survival is the same, whether you do mastectomy or lumpectomy. Okay, but mastectomy will have more like uh, things that you have to, to remember, like these three main things. Huh? The most important thing is the radiotherapy. I have patients, I do lumpectomy, margins clear, everything good. And they ask me, do I really need radiotherapy? I said it was already decided you need radiotherapy. So sometimes the women don't understand and then they change their mind after the, the lumpectomy and they suddenly say, I don't want radiotherapy. Okay. Now, this is the radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is about 25 times, five minutes each time, minimal side effects. You don't lose your hair, you don't vomit. Patients usually confuse radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So again, it's a lot of patient education Education of the patient is vital to proper treatment because the patient has to understand why we are doing this. What will happen if we don't do this? If we don't do radiotherapy, there's a 40% chance of local recurrence. Okay, Even with radiotherapy, the local recurrence rate is 10%. So 25 times is daily. So Monday to Friday, five minutes each time. So if you live very far away, then I would say don't do radiotherapy. Like in Kuantan, there is no radiotherapy machine. In the whole state, actually, there's no radiation. Pahang, isn't it? See, the whole state got no radiation. So the patient will have to travel to KL or up north to Kota Baru for radiotherapy. In that case, they might as well do a mastectomy where radiotherapy is not essential. So radiotherapy, you need to have access to the radiotherapy facilities. In KL, PJ, no problem. There are more radiotherapy centers than needed. So the especially the private radiotherapy centers are all fighting for the patients. 
And I have to tell you, radiotherapy now is even, is also very high tech. You can have the normal, no more cobalt machines, that one is no, not used anymore. But the conformal radiotherapy, where the beams can curve, that can cost like for 30 to 40,000 ringgit. Even the normal 3D radiotherapy we do for breasts in the private sector is about 15,000 ringgit for the 25 times. Okay, so this is radiotherapy. I always tell them mastectomy actually costs less than lumpectomy. Really, it costs much less than lumpectomy. So for to save money, you can take out the breast. Now, that's another type of radiotherapy called intraoperative radiotherapy. And this is, they are trying to sell it, but there's only five hospitals in Malaysia with this machine. Eh? This is intraoperative radiotherapy. Step one, this is the lump. This is only for small early cancers, okay? Small early cancers. Step two, you remove the lump. There's a cavity there. Step three, you put this radiation applicator in. And after the radiotherapy, it's only for 30 minutes, you take it out and close the skin. So if you stay far away and you are suitable, suitable means you have a small, good type of cancer, then you can do this. You don't have to do the 25 times external beam radiotherapy. Very convenient. This one costs more money than the external beam. Huh? This is the miniaturized linear accelerator. You see, there's one beam here, okay? So this is in theater, it's more bound, you can move it to another theater. And that's what it looks like. It's got a very uh, mobile arm that we can move around. Okay, and the clinical trials have been done to show that this gives the same local control and overall survival as the external beam radiotherapy. All right, so two ways of delivering radiotherapy. External beam 25 times or intraoperative, probably one shot if you have a very early good type of cancer. Not many women actually are suitable for IORT unless they come early enough. As, as you know, most of our women don't come early enough. Now, this is lumpectomy. If you remove a large volume of tissue, it will not look good. There's discrepancy between the two breasts. If you need to remove more than 20% of the breast, the cosmetic score is poor. So in this sort of case, you need a reconstructive procedure. Either do a full mastect and reconstruct, or you can do an oncoplastic breast conserving surgery, which I shall talk about later. Now, if the tumor is near the nipple, we can still do breast conserving surgery, but the distortion can be more significant. And in this case, also, you need an oncoplastic breast conserving technique. You can actually do a mastopexy on this side and pull it up as well. This is what I mean by oncoplastic breast conserving surgery. They use local flaps to reconstruct the defect caused by the white local excision. Currently, actually, there's no code in the MMA fee for this procedure, so they can call it local flap, rotation flap, or whatever. So depending on where the tumor is, they have different incisions. Now, the on, now breast surgeons call themselves oncoplastic breast surgeons. That means that they do both the breast surgery as well as the plastic surgery to make your breast nice again. So the oncoplastic breast surgeons actually do their own breast reconstruction. They don't look for plastic surgeons anymore. Now, this is the selection criteria for breast conserving surgery. Size, the most important thing is size, okay? If you want to do a lumpectomy, the lump has got to be small enough so that you take out the lump plus one cm around it, you still got enough breast tissue to produce a cosmetically acceptable breast. Solitary, if you have, uh, like I showed you the case, two lumps in different quadrants of the breast, definitely you have to take out the whole breast. You can't do a double lumpectomy. No contraindications to radiotherapy. The patient agrees, can go to a radiotherapy center, but if you are pregnant, you can't do radiotherapy, SLE, dermatomyositis. Cases like this, the skin does not respond well to radiotherapy. I recently had a patient with dermatomyositis. Of course, we definitely did a mastectomy for her because there's no role for radiotherapy. 
And central tumors, can we do? Right now, we say, yes, you can. If it's very close to the nipple, you can even take out the nipple and reconstruct it later. Okay, then we use decision aids to help patients decide on what type of surgery. This was uh, developed by UM together with the Cancer Research Center, uh, Cancer Research Malaysia, CRM. So, in this, we have the advantages and disadvantages of lumpectomy versus mastectomy versus alternative versus no treatment. So this is given to the patient. We've got it in about four languages. So they can keep on reading this. If they do lumpectomy, what's going to happen? If they do mastectomy, what's going to happen? Or they don't do anything, what's going to happen? Most women will die within five years. That is what's going to happen. Okay? Mm. And... You see, the problem with lumpectomy is sometimes if margins are not clear, you might need another operation. So what I do in the private sector is because you can't afford a second operation, I do frozen section. That means I immediately send the lump to test and the pathologist can tell me whether the margins are clear or not. Same thing with sentinel lymph node biopsy. I will send for immediate testing. If sentinel lymph node has cancer, then I will immediately remove the rest of the lymph nodes. Okay? So this is also the other page. Will I lose my breast? Is chemotherapy recommended? How much does it cost? You see, again, I say financial counseling is very important. So the patient knows exactly how much it's going to cost. Okay? Some patients are too shy to tell us about the cost. You know, you should not be because you don't want to suddenly find out that you don't have the money to pay for it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about breast reconstruction now because now a lot of women are asking for reconstruction if they need a mastectomy. Reconstruction is not covered by insurance. Okay. They have to pay out of pocket. Mm. In my practice, 20% of the mastectomies I do are reconstructed. Age is not the limit. I've done two women over 70 who wanted immediate reconstruction. Reconstruction is a woman's choice. It's a decision. And we usually do with autologous tissue. That means using the patient's own tissues to make a new breast. This is more difficult, take a longer time, but the long-term results are better. In fact, now a lot of papers are coming from the USA to say that if you do reconstruction with implants, long-term, there is actually poorer quality of life because implants are not natural. Implants are when you use the implants to reconstruct the breast. The operation is shorter, it's cheaper even with the cost of the implant, but it's a foreign body which stays in your body forever and long-term may give problems such as infection, rupture, and contracture. Who does the reconstruction? Plastic surgeon or breast surgeons? I'm the old-fashioned one. I was trained in the old-fashioned way, so I always work with a plastic surgeon. But the younger, newer breast surgeons do their own reconstruction. I feel that plastic surgeons actually have more techniques available to them because they are trained in plastic surgery. So this is the example of the autologous reconstruction. So you get, this is lead dorsi, we use the back. Okay, you get a scar here and then you get a new breast here. If it's not big enough, we can take fat from your tummy, liposuction, and we inject fat here to make it bigger. This is the tummy, the tram flap. Now, trend flap, you get a big scar from here to here. It's longer. Because I work with a plastic surgeon, we work at the same time, lateral position. It takes me two hours to do this. This one, even with working together, is three hours because it's technically more difficult to use the tummy. But you still will get a breast in the end. Send me documents and we print out. Okay. Sorry, somebody asked me something. Okay, so this is autologous breast reconstruction. Now, this is using implants. The implants is, you know, this is a silicone implant. It is put under the muscle. It's very important. You know, it's easy. You just take out the breast. You think it just can put an implant there. It's not so easy. The implant has to be covered by muscle. If you just put under the skin, it's actually very ugly because your skin is too thin. So you get this ripple effect. So this is 
the direct to implant means the implants are placed under the muscle, but the muscle may be deficient. So you can use an acellular donor matrix to cover the deficient area. Like this area, there's no muscle. So there's this uh, alloderm they use to cover it. And this alloderm can be like 12,000 ringgit just for a small piece like this, you know. Another method is to use the tissue expander under the muscle, expand it gradually, and when the cavity is big enough, then you insert an implant. So this is using implants is very finicky, you know. Um, we don't use it that often. You know, ten percent of my patients with reconstruction actually get implant. I usually use the the, the autologous. So when do I use an implant since I don't like to use it? It is when patient refuse to have tissue taken from the back or the tummy. Okay? Yeah. Because this is a skin sparing mastectomy, that means we spare the skin. Okay? The nipple can be reconstructed. So because we spare the skin, you can put an implant, that's what they call direct to implant, directly under the muscle. Okay, now these are the types of implants, smooth versus texture, round versus anatomic, saline versus silicone. Silicone is hardier and feel more natural. Saline implant can leak. The saline can be easily absorbed and then suddenly everything falls flat. If a silicone implant leaks, it can cause adhesions. Okay? Silicone was said to be associated with various autoimmune diseases, but this now has been largely proven to be untrue. Textured implants are less likely to move around the cavity created by the surgeon. However, in recent years, it has been associated with a rare form of cancer called ALCL. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of this. This is anaplastic large cell lymphoma which is a rare type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and one of the subtypes of T-cell lymphoma. So the risk could be as high as 1 in 1,000 to 10,000 women. I mean, that's a very big sort of number, isn't it? It's because nobody really knows okay, how the risk is. But right now, women who have the textured implants, some of them are actually getting the implants out and replacing it with the other type of implants. So these are examples of skin sparing mastectomy and immediate reconstruction. See, sometimes there is discrepancy in the size and they can be adjusted later. It's what we call symmetrization. This can be done at a later stage. Okay. And then the nipple can be reconstructed and you tattoo it. Okay, like this one, the nipple is not reconstructed. Once it's reconstructed, you can tattoo the areola in the nipple. Now, this is delayed breast reconstruction. So, after the patient has a mastect and x ray clearance, all the radiotherapy, everything has been done, she suddenly decides she wants a recon. She cannot accept a mastectomy. You can do a delayed one, but after radiotherapy, you have to wait at least a year until the skin is back to normal before you can actually do a delayed breast reconstruction. Okay. Now, is surgery alone enough? That means just do the operation and that's it. Surgery alone is usually not enough. You still need treatment called adjuvant therapy, which is chemotherapy, radiotherapy, hormone therapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, which I have talked about just now. And to decide what you need, the pathology report is the most important. So you must know the size, the grade, the lymph nodes, the ER, the PR, the HER2, T67, and the margins, whether the margins are clear or not. It's important for prognosis and treatment. So since the pathology report decides your prognosis and treatment, the pathologist is the most important member of the team. Okay? So the treatment options depend on the molecular subtype of breast cancer. Just now I told you about the ER, PR, and HER2. This is like the profile of your cancer. So every woman should know what type of breast cancer she has. And some women now are very smart. They can tell me I've got triple negative breast cancer. Then I immediately know what it is. 
because triple negative breast cancer like this one, ER negative, PR negative, this is a study that we did in UMMC. About 20% of women have triple negative breast cancer. But in Kuching, Sarawak, this is a study from there, 29% have triple negative because their aboriginal uh, races there actually have a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer. And in the States, the Africans have a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer, which is the most aggressive type. The least aggressive type is the ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative subtype. And this is a very good subtype. Luckily, majority of women have this good subtype because this subtype, you can actually just give hormone therapy, okay? HER2 positive is more aggressive than negative. So the triple positive, about 15%, the negative, negative, positive, about 20%. Also, this is an aggressive subtype. So from best to worst, you have this is the best and this is the worst, okay? Now, we have also done a study, the survival according to subtypes in the UN. This was one, one of my research there is to look at breast cancer outcomes. In this paper that I did, there was no difference in the five-year survival between the triple negative and the negative negative HER2 subtypes. Okay? Because actually, if you are ER negative, PR negative, HER2 positive, you can actually have her septin, but her septin that time used to be like 100,000 ringgit for the year of treatment. So a lot of people did not have access to her septin. So if you have no access to her septin, your survival will be the same as the triple negative sometime. Because if you are ER, ER negative, you cannot have hormone therapy, it doesn't work. So you have the best survival was the ER positive, PR ER positive, HER2 negative, second was the triple positive, and the Third and fourth type had the same survival, which was poorer. So chemotherapy is, if you need chemo, is given first. We usually have the treatment one by one. You don't have it all together, one shot. So chemo is given four to six weeks after surgery and usually six cycles at three weekly intervals. So chemotherapy is the one where you can lose your hair, you can vomit and all that. Okay, so this is chemotherapy. If you need radiotherapy, it's given after the chemotherapy. So chemo always comes first before radiotherapy because it's felt that chemo is more important than radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is for the local control. Chemo prevents your cancer coming back in your lungs, liver or bones. And those are the ones that can kill you. Okay. So these are the indications for adjuvant chemotherapy. This is from the clinical practice guidelines. You know, Malaysia, we do have clinical practice guidelines. The newest one actually was 2020, 10 years later, but basically it's the same as here. So you give chemo if you have nodes involved, ERPL negative, HER2-3 plus tumor size more than two or grade three. You only need one of this. Okay, you only need one of this to need chemotherapy. Grade 3 is what the pathologists see. Okay? It depends on what the cells look like. So you have grade 1, 2, 3. 3 looks the most aggressive and 1 looks the least aggressive. Okay? So these are the indications for adjuvant chemotherapy. Overall, we find that about 60 to 70% of our women actually have adjuvant chemotherapy. Some of them, even if they need it, they may refuse. And then you can sort of have a discussion again about the benefits of chemotherapy. Hormone therapy is very easy. You only give it if you have ER positive cancers. Most women are compliant to hormone therapy because it's just a tablet you take. It used to be five years, but now it's actually given more for 10 years, okay? ER positive. But uh, tamoxifen can cause uterus thickening. So we always need to send to the uh, uh, gynecologist every year if they are on tamoxifen. This is the other option for postmenopausal women. This is the other hormones that you can take. You know, letrozole, aromatase inhibitors. So this is adjuvant hormone therapy. Now, targeted therapy is the most expensive. Herceptin now is generic, so you can get it for 50,000 for one year of treatment. Used to be more than 100,000 for one year of treatment. It's an injection every three weeks for a year for cancers that are HER2 positive. HER2 
HER2 positive also need chemotherapy. So it's usually given with chemotherapy initially. And then after chemotherapy, six cycles, we continue accepting for the rest of the year. Okay? So this is targeted therapy. Now I'm coming towards the end now. So there's a paradigm shift in the surgical treatment of breast cancer from maximum surgery, which was the Halstead era, the radical mastectomy, to breast conserving surgery, and now even minimal surgery. Now they say you just need to actually do a mammotome and take out the lung and that's it. So less is more, that's what it is now. And what has been shown is that less gives you the same outcomes as more. That means it doesn't matter whether you do the maximum or the minimal surgery, the survival should be the same as long as you do a good clearance, good clear job. Now, even radiotherapy from maximum radiation last time, they used to give the core belt more fractions. Now there's less radiation. In fact, now for mastectomy, they only use 50. 15 fractions, that means 15 times, that means only three weeks. Even less radiation, which is the intraoperative radiotherapy, which is single dose. Again, less is more. The single dose has been shown to give you the same survival outcome as the maximum dose. So what about the future? So first we had mastectomy. And then we had breast conserving surgery, which is preservation of the breast. And then we have sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is preservation of the axilla. And oncoplastic surgery, which is preservation of more body image. So now it's very important that whatever we do, the woman comes out of it with a nice looking breast, good body image. So what does the future hold? They say later, there may be no need for surgery for breast cancer and just treated by the oncologist alone. I hope that doesn't come. I think right now, with early breast cancer, you still need surgery. If you come with stage four, maybe you don't need surgery. But stage one, two, three, you still need surgery because it is still curable to have one, two, three. Okay, now what about follow-up? Initially, we do six monthly follow-up, then yearly. And what do we look for during follow-up? We need to look for a recurrence or a new cancer because the opposite breast can have a new cancer, okay, 5% contralateral breast cancer. And if you did a breast conserving surgery, what about follow-up? Initially, we do six months. If on hormone therapy, you have to continue and ask for any side effects. If on tamoxifen, check that the patient is seeing the gynecologist. Ask for any symptoms of metastasis, usually spread to lungs, liver, or bones, rarely the brain. So ask for symptoms like backache, cough, difficulty breathing, loss of weight. And ask about general well-being, whether they've returned to work, whether depressed. This is actually just doing an uh, assessment of uh, uh, quality of life. I'm sure you are all familiar with quality of life assessments and check for any medical problems. You know, they can develop hypertension, diabetes and all that because breast cancer, generally, the prognosis is good. So overall, you can get about 75% five-year survival. And if you have stage one, the survival is now up to 90% over. Stage two, about 80 to 90%. Even stage three, you can get 60 to 70% five-year survival. And of course, even metastatic breast cancer with continuous treatment, especially the good types, you can even live for 10 years or even more. I have a friend who's surviving more than 10 years with metastatic breast cancer, but needs treatment all the time, you know. So the patient has to have willpower or money because the treatment gets more and more expensive. Um, as you get more and more recurrences, okay? Uh, but the um, outlook is very good for breast cancer now because they're developing more and more drugs. So the message to take home is breast cancer can be cured if detected and treated early. Detection methods are screening, mammography, clinical breast examination, and breast self-examination. Autism therapy is not effective and delays proper treatment. Making the correct decision is important. That's what we do. You know, we have to do a lot of patient education to make sure 
that they make the correct decision. They make the wrong decision to go and try alternative therapy. You lose a lot of time because when they come back to us for proper treatment, the stage has become two. From one, it can become two, can become three, can become four. And how long it takes to become stage four depends on the type of cancer. If you have a good, slow-growing type, like the ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative, grade one, you know, you can actually go on for a few years before you even actually reach stage four. On the average, it takes like two years to reach stage four. So it's not a cancer that is going to grow very fast. But if you find it at stage one and you treat it, your cure rate is like over 90%. So the emphasis is on early detection and treatment. Some people are detected early, but they don't go for proper treatment. So decision-making is something that we have to teach the patient to do. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That's my last slide. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yip, uh, for a very enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm sure all of us have learned a lot of things, but uh, we would like to ask for any questions for anybody who has got questions. You can either type it on the chat box or you can uh, you can uh, ask directly. Any questions to yeah, Professor Prof. Vision. Prof. Vision. So I have, I have some questions for uh, uh, you. Can ask Prof. directly, no problem. Yes, right. you can ask me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the 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 Doctor uh, Yeah. Thank you very much for. Uh, uh, the, in a very good presentation, and uh, I'm sure you know. I'm sure in one session, so it's you know, almost impossible to cover a lot of things. So uh, you have done you know like a overview of the overall management, and you know that's quite comprehensive. And thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm uh, I'm uh, Dr. Subhash. I'm from uh, surgery department, and I'm a general surgeon with uh, special interest in uh, breast surgery. Okay, so I, I, mean, I have a few questions and, you know, also maybe a few clarifications. Yes. So first one, you know, like uh, um, you just now said that uh, in case of uh, a locally advanced breast cancer, so mastectomy is not really indicated. Uh, but what I understand is uh, a mastectomy may still be required, even if it is you not know, locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, to prevent the local complications like you know fungation and ulceration and secondary infection, bleeding, pain, and so on. So we used to call this as a toilet mastectomy, which is not a it's not a healthy word, but uh, that's what it, it meant, you know, because it's going to be a kind of a, a dirty mass and we need to uh, get rid of it. So even in a locally advanced breast cancer, I think still you know mastectomy may still be indicated for palliation. Yes, I do. We do a lot of, in fact, we do emergency mastectomy. For example, um, I told you some of the patients come with really, like this one is a fungating ulcerating lesion and she comes bleeding. If I send to the oncologist, it will take ages for them to control this. So I would actually do a mastectomy for her and you can do a lead dorsi flap skin cover. So this is the situation where we can do an emergency mastectomy. Sometimes when they come bleeding and it's not operable because the patient is too sick, we've seen that before because they are on alternative, they go on sick diets where they are so skinny, I would send for uh, hemostatic radiotherapy. That means I would send to the oncologist, they can use radiotherapy to stop the bleeding. Okay, so these are instances where I would do an emergency uh, mastectomy. Like even this lady, Everybody was saying that you must be crazy to operate on her. You see, look at this lady. She is fungating and she has tried alternative therapy from all over Malaysia as well as uh, Indonesia. And from a small lump, she was diagnosed with a small stage one breast cancer. It took her one year to reach this stage. That means it grew very fast. Usually, you take a few years to reach this stage. This one also, we did an immediate mastectomy for her because they lose a lot of fluid, you know. You see how wet it is? They are wet all the time. So this is a person that you would do a quick mastectomy because that's the best palliation. Eventually, she died one year later, but she died with her chest wall intact. So it's on a case-to-case -case basis. If locally advanced, there's no bleeding, no ulceration. It's time for them to have chemo first because then, because when you do surgery for a local, Usually, you won't be able to get clear margins. They will still need chemotherapy and radiotherapy. 
And sometimes after you do for them, you actually disappear. Because women who come with these advanced cancers, they probably know they have cancer, but they um, are not ready to have surgery. So sometimes if you catch them and operate on them fast, at least you've done one treatment, you know. Because if they go for chemotherapy and it shrinks, then you won't see them again. Okay, Prof. Uh, there's one more, one more question. I mean, uh, this kind of uh, no, uh, suggestion, because what we normally, you know, once uh, the patient undergoes surgery, especially uh, axillary dissection or clearance, and uh, we, you know, we, uh, you know, tell the, uh, the, especially the other doctors and nurses that not to use, you know, that upper limb for, you know, any uh, IV fluids or IV injections, cannulation and so on. Mm -hmm. So as to minimize the chances of, you know, lymphedema. And we also, you know, we also, you know, like uh, warn the patient that in case anybody is, you know, let's say, for example, any nurses and so on, if they attempt to give any injection on that side. So they have to, you know, like let them know that, you know, they have to use the other arm. So I think that's also you know, like is an important I think advice we need to give to the patients. Yes, yes. Actually, for those who have axillary dissection, we usually will have instructions like that, um, and they have to do exercise the arm early, otherwise they get frozen shoulder. In fact, within one week they should be able to lift their arm fully, you know. So um, and using and not using the arm for eye. <laughs> taking usually the nurses will know, you know I'm not sure but I think our nurses are quite quite with it you know when it comes to women with breast cancer also you must have a breast care nurse to do all the education for you as well yeah and Patient also education like I say is the most important right and, and another thing is uh, when it comes to sorry sorry okay when it comes to tamoxifen I think uh, more than you know more than screening for uterine cancer. I think the major, you know, major, I uh, you know, like uh, uh, side effect with tamoxifen is a uh, thromboembolism. Yeah, that can be, you know, that can be, you know, an emergency and, uh, you know, whereas for the uterine cancer, we can still do screening. I mean, periodic, you know, screening, you know, with um, gynae appointment and ultrasound and so on for uh, the monitoring the thickness and all that, some cytology. But I think thromboembolism is, is uh, one, you know, which is of uh, more, you know, grave concern in terms of side effects of tamoxifen. Yes, certainly. That's why if they are postmenopausal, the um, common therapy of choice is still the aromatase inhibitor. Unfortunately, it's more expensive and currently the Malaysian clinical practice guidelines will still say tamoxifen as the first choice, mainly because of the cost issue and mainly because um, the aromatase inhibitor and the tamoxifen, when you look at overall survival, there's no difference. I checked the clinical practice guidelines, so I can tell you that the outcome you look for is actually overall survival. Whereas overseas quality of life is also an uh, uh, outcome. Because you know when you, you need evidence-based medicine, you know, so they always have to look at the final thing for evidence-based medicine for any treatment for breast cancer is still overall survival. If you don't get any benefit for overall survival, it usually will not get into your guidelines. Also, they have look at the cost as well. Certainly in private practice, all women postmenopausal, they will usually get aromatase inhibitors yeah, unless they have osteoporosis or they do not want it because you always give them the pros and cons. You give them the side effects of tamoxifen and the side effects of aromatase inhibitors and then the patient will find, make a final decision. Okay, for my, my last question, uh, when it comes to breast conserving surgeries like a wide local excision, I think one more one more problem you know is about uh, unclear margins. You know, whatever we excise, if the yes. margins are not clear, they will require a re a re surgery after a few days. That is why I do frozen section for margins because I'm in the private sector. We can't afford to take the patient back in for surgery. Patients again, again frozen section is not 100% accurate also because they can be false you know like uh, negative know, well. but usually you look at your pathologies I have a very good pathologist okay. you know okay thank you thank you so much thank you okay any further questions Prof Eugene there are a few questions in the chat can you I cannot get the chat you know yeah, um, I think uh, Eugene, uh, yeah. That's right. I'm going to get it down, yeah. Can Dr. Punita can just hang on. I cannot read the chat. Can you read it to me? Okay. 
there's a question that says that if a, if a patient has got a breast cancer and is, for example, in the first operation, this ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 negative, if she gets a recurrence later, can it become suddenly ER positive and PR positive? Yes, definitely, but very rare. It's more common for an ER positive cancer to turn into an ER negative cancer than for an ER negative to turn to ER positive. They say that uh, positive turn to negative can be about 30% incident. So the teaching now is that if you get a recurrence, whether local or metastatic, you must have a biopsy to look at the ERPR HER2. HER2 can change from positive to negative, but about 10% chance of this. So it's very important to actually biopsy the metastatic site. We do that all the time. All the oncologists now will do uh, biopsy for metastatic site. Uh, there's a question about the use of ULA ULAREP. Is ULAPARIP, is it? Yeah, no, it, it, the, the person asking is ULAREP medicine. Is it of value in metastatic breast cancer? I think they mean OLAPARIP. It's a, a PAP inhibitor, is that what they mean? A PAP inhibitor in metastatic breast cancer is only used if you are BRCA positive. They have tried it for triple negative breast cancer without much uh, improvement. So you need to be BRCA positive. BRCA positive breast cancer is only like 5 to 10%. And the BRCA is not just a blood test that you can do, you know. This is a genetic test. So you have to have genetic counseling because being BRCA positive does not involve only you, you know, it involves your whole family because it means you have a mutation in the family. So your family will have a higher incidence of getting a mutation and then having breast cancer. But Olaparib works very well. They're talking about doing um, genetic testing for all triple negative breast cancers below 50 years old because 18% of them may have a BRCA uh, mutation, in which case Olaparib would work very well. Okay, there's another question about the use of tamoxifen beyond five years. Oh yes, the studies have shown so it was published like two, three years ago that tamoxifen for 10 years uh, gives you a better survival than tamoxifen for five years. So now even the clinical practice guidelines, which was revised in the year 2020, this is last year, they actually uh, recommend tamoxifen for 10 years. Okay, but we also look at the patient. Uh, if they are node positive, high risk of relapse, then we would recommend tamoxifen for more than five years. Because for ER positive, PR positive breast cancer, even though the rate of relapse is highest in the first three years, after five years, at the sixth and seventh year, there's another peak of relapse. I'm sure you've heard of women, after five years, they stop tamoxifen, one year later, they get a relapse. So if you have tamoxifen for 10 years, it was going to prevent that relapse at the sixth and seventh year, which can occur. And I've seen it occur so often, more often enough for me to actually recommend all the women that I see on tamoxifen. After five years, they say, can I stop? I say, no, continue for another five years. Or if they are postmenopausal, they can go to using letrozole and aromatase inhibitor. Because sometimes they uh, start tamoxifen when they are like in their 40s. By the time they finish five years, they are menopausal. Then they can go on the aromatase inhibitor another five years. That has also been shown to improve the survival and reduce the relapse rate. After 10 years, nobody knows what to do because there's no study after 10 years on any hormone therapy. Uh, Prof, uh, may I add? Uh, they, yeah, they, also done, you know, they have also done uh, sequential, you know, like uh, um, administration that is, you know, like uh, younger patients, for example, they start with uh, tamoxifen and during the treatment, you know, with the tamox. So once, you know, once they attain uh, menopause and then they are continued, you know, with, uh, you know, aromatase inhibitor that's, subsequently. That's what we do as well. And in some cases, um, if they're still premenopausal, the oncologist will make them menopausal <clears throat> in high risk. Uh, breast cancer, that means women who have a high risk of relapse, like all the 
bad features that I told you just now, you know, the great tree, the no positive, you know, if they are ERP ER positive, um, as well as if they are premenopausal, they also mm. recommend oophorectomy, <clears throat> which is a bit uh, extreme, but um, some oncologists actually recommend it. Depends on the oncologist. You know, you know, the oncologist, you send them to oncologists. There are some very extreme ones, very aggressive ones, and there are some not so aggressive ones. So, you know, usually when patients come back to tell me what the oncologist recommended, I would say, wow, really? Then I know which what oncologists do. Because for me as a surgeon, last time in UM in the 1990s, 1993, I started the breast clinic there. There were no oncologists. I used to give my own chemotherapy, my own uh, hormone therapy, and uh, refer them to HKL for radiotherapy if needed. But now there are so many oncologists. So I don't even recommend hormone therapy. I just send them all to the oncologist. Once they have surgery, you have to report. I said, you'll get an oncology opinion. <clears throat> I think this is what all units do now. You know, it's multidisciplinary board. You know, we don't, in private hospital, we don't have a formal one because of the COVID, we didn't get to meet, but we actually call each other with a WhatsApp tumor board for any difficult cases. But in UM, all cases are discussed in tumor board and the plan of treatment is all decided. And we, all the patients get to see an oncologist, whatever the stage and whatever. So... This is what we mean by multidisciplinary uh, treatment. It's been shown to improve the survival if you have a multidisciplinary uh, 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 board meeting for each patient. But Prof, instead of instead of oophorectomy, we also have the option of you know reversible you know ovarian separation with the GNRH. There are channel. so many methods of oophorectomy: medical, uh, radiation, and uh, surgical. The radiation, they don't do so much now because radiation oophorectomy sometimes fail, you know. Sometimes it really fails. And besides, the patient gets so many side effects. Some of them get diarrhea and everything. So usually they will use the medical or the, or the uh, surgical. But medical oophorectomy actually in the end is more expensive because you need it every three months. But for young women in their 20s, 30s, they prefer medical oophorectomy. Oh, I have seen some women who actually are agreeable to um, surgical oophorectomy. So it is so easy, they do it laparoscopically. I mean, usually the oncologist will have a usual uh, uh, gynae to refer to. And this is the problem in private practice. The insurance also say, is it necessary? Why are you taking out the ovaries? It's a big question, you know, because if you look at the clinical practice guidelines, oophorectomy is only recommended for stage four breast cancer, that's ER positive, ER positive, and premenopausal. So for stage one, two, three, is still very much uh, controversial. Thank you, thank you, Rolf. Thank you very much. The evidence oh, for oophorectomy is not that high, but despite that, uh, oncologists are recommending it. Uh, Prof, I think maybe when somebody asked, when will you test for the BRCA? When do I test for what? Test for BRCA. Oh, actually, uh, we have a huge research program in UM. We have a huge research program, but if you are not done under research, we only test it if you meet the criteria. And if you look at the clinical practice guidelines, they have a criteria for BRCA testing. You will have two first degree relatives, first degree, okay? First degree means mother or sister. Two first degree relatives, one of which got it before 50 years old. Because breast cancer is so common, not many of them have actually got BRCA, okay? And if you have a personal history of ovarian cancer, then you would do the BRCA, or you have a family member with ovarian cancer, or your father has breast cancer, you would do the BRCA testing, okay? Uh, but we do under research, uh, we know a lot, we have a lot of information about what type of patients are. Now they say triple negative, less than 50 or so, we would do BRCA testing, you know? So, uh, there are certain criteria. If you look at the clinical practice guidelines, it will give you the criteria for testing outside the research program. But testing, you need to actually see a genetic counsellor. Genetic counsellor will talk to you for 
one hour because you have to understand what being a BRCA means to you, your family, and further treatment. If you have a BRCA mutation, you have a 50% chance of contralateral breast cancer. So the option is to remove your opposite breast. If you have a BRCA, you have like a 30% chance of ovarian cancer. So you have to remove your ovaries. You know, if a patient does not want to know, does not want to go on to all this, then why are they testing? They can say they can test to protect their family, but their family may not want to know because this is like a stigma to your family. We have actually done a lot of qualitative research regarding BRCA testing as well. The fear of knowing is what prevents a lot of people from testing. Okay. Uh, uh, Prof. Yip, there's another Besides uh, BRCA, is there any other uh, genetic test that is uh, yes, we do relevant? Yes, mutations. This is uh, the panel testing that I've been doing with CRM for research. We do BRCA1, BRCA2, PARP B2, and TP53. These are the four well-known ones. Okay? Doing these four panels, it's, if we do it uh, for the patient, a patient's request not under research, it's about... 2,000 ringgit, they send it to USA. Okay, they will do everything for you. You get your results in like two, three weeks. There are commercial panels like the BRCA Pro, you know, it's uh, offered by commercial companies. They can do like, uh, well, I think there's one 20 gene test or something, you know. One of my friends who's treated in UK, her mother and aunt had breast cancer, so she got herself tested and she was a PAR B2 positive, of which you don't know much about because PAR B2 is just newly, sort of a newly, in a way, diagnosed uh, mutation where a lot of studies have been done, but it's not as bad as BRCA1 and 2 and you don't get contralateral breast cancer. We have actually done PAR B2 and TP53 in all our under research for our patients and our papers have all been published already. We are now going more into genomic profiling and genetic sequencing of the whole uh, tumor. You know? So these are the sort of things we've been doing. Not germline, but tumor sequencing. Uh, I think we have one last question, if Prof. Gib allows. Uh, yes. If they are tested positive besides BRCA, what's the difference in the treatment? Oh, BRCA. You see, uh, uh, non-BRCA, the one that you okay. mentioned, the two new ones, yeah. Yeah, you see, uh, because we have got a big uh, research program in BRCA, we've got all these BRCA families. Sorry, somebody's calling me. We have this BRCA family. So um, I had a patient whom we know is BRCA and she's got breast cancer. What treatment does it, what difference does it make in my treatment? You can still do a lumpectomy because lumpectomy and mastectomy have the same outcomes in BRCA positive. But some women may choose to do bilateral mastect and recon if they know they are BRCA positive and they have breast cancer on one side. Okay, that's one option. And the chemotherapy, the oncologist, right now, there's no chemo specifically for BRCA positive patients in the adjuvant setting. But they may be more likely to use cisplatin in the, in the chemotherapy because cisplatin has been shown to have uh, good results in women who have advanced BRCA associated breast cancer. If you have a metastatic breast cancer, then you can use Olaparib together with chemotherapy. So these are the differences, okay? If you have BRCA positive associated breast cancer versus a normal breast cancer. So there could be changes to your surgery. You might want to take up both breasts and reconstruct. You might want to take up your ovaries at the same time as the breast surgery. Okay? Um, okay. And um, the chemotherapy may be a bit different. That's about all. Okay, I think time is running and I think we would like to thank everyone, especially Professor Yip and Professor Rusli, uh, Dr. Punita Wati and Dr. Lim and uh, Dr. Lim Suyin and everybody who came for this very interesting lecture. And I can tell you that uh, probably in August or September, we have already invited Prof. Yip and she has accepted 
to talk about benign breast disease uh, in another lecture, which we will keep you updated. And if you need further information, you can WhatsApp or email me directly and we will keep you up to date as to the date and uh, the time of the next lecture by Professor Yip, which will be in either August or September of this year. Right? Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everyone, for having contributed a lot of interesting questions. And I think we will probably be better equipped to advise and to, uh, to send patients to the correct person. Thank you very much, Professor Yip and Professor Rusty. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank okay. you very much for inviting me. Okay, goodbye. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy